Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I have the honor of introducing to you Professor Stuart Russell. He is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley and director of CHAI, the Center for Human Compatible AI. He is the author of Human Compatible and his book, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, is the standard text in artificial intelligence. He'll be speaking to us today about provably beneficial AI, including topics like probabilistic programming and formal verification. After the talk, we'll have time to ask questions. There's a questions tab on swap card where you can ask questions and upvote ones you want asked. Thank you, Professor Russell. Okay, hey, thanks very much, Vivek. Uh, and I apologize for the delay. I'm uh, out at the beach and Wi-Fi is not always completely reliable here. So it took a while to get everything lined up. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go through the talk fairly quickly. So we have lots of time for Q&A, at least some time for Q&A. Um, the first part will basically be uh, a quick reminder of where we got to last year in the, the talk I gave um, about uh, what we mean by provably beneficial AI uh, and the approach that we're taking. Um, so uh, AI in the standard model, um, which has been pretty much in force since the beginning of the field, is that machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Um, so those objectives could be uh, logical goals for problem solving and planning systems. They could be constraints for uh, CSP solvers. They could be uh, reward functions for MDP solvers or reinforcement learning algorithms and so on, or, or LUS functions for supervised learning. Uh, and one of the failure modes for this kind of AI system uh, is that we fail to specify these objectives correctly. And we call this the King Midas problem because of course, King Midas specified his objective of turning uh, everything he touched into gold. And that was the incorrect objective causing him to die uh, of starvation. Um, so if you take that, uh, that failure mode and you combine it with increasingly capable AI systems, uh, then you get exactly the potentially catastrophic loss of control that Alan Turing talked about uh, in 1951, when he said it seems horrible that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. And at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Uh, so I think this is probably what he had in mind as the failure mode. Um, and I think we're already starting to see it with what's happening in social media. Um, those algorithms have uh, a well-defined objective from their point of view uh, to maximize click-through or engagement or some other measure of uh, how much interaction uh, there is between the human uh, and the platform. And you might think that in order to maximize such an objective, uh, the best thing to do is to learn what people want and send them only stuff they're interested in because that way they will, uh, they will uh, interact more with it. Um, but that's actually not the solution, and it's uh, it's only the solution uh, if you think of people as completely static objects. But of course, uh, if you're a reinforcement learning algorithm, then your goal is to maximize your long-term reward by changing the state of the environment, in this case, changing the state of the person's brain. Uh, and so you can get more reward if you modify people uh, so that they become more predictable in future. Um, so this is one possible explanation for why we're seeing uh, such uh, polarization uh, and sort of rabbit hole behavior uh, from uh, tens of millions of people. And these algorithms, of course, are really, really simple. They don't know that human beings exist. You are, you are nothing more than a sequence of clicks uh, to these algorithms. And all they want to do is to make that sequence more predictable. Um, but of course, if they were, uh, more capable if they did have a better understanding of human psychology and, uh, and belief systems and all the rest, uh, then the outcome would be far worse than it already is. Um, so this illustrates this idea that um, when you have this standard model with fixed objectives, um, making AI better does not make the outcome better for human beings. Um, and I think one, one way of sort of retroactively reconstructing this history is to say that 
Uh, so back in the 40s and 50s, when the field was uh, beginning, when we were starting to think about what AI meant, uh, we borrowed this idea of intelligence that was already uh, fairly widespread in the intellectual community, that uh, intelligence was really identified with rationality, right? The ability to choose actions that can be expected to achieve our objectives. And that's fine for humans to be rational. Um, but then when you copy that over to machines, uh, you get this problem that the machines don't have intrinsic objectives of their own in the way that humans do. Uh, so we have to plug them in and that creates uh, the possibility of putting in incorrect objectives. So um, I would argue that the standard model is flawed as a methodology. And instead we want a slightly different definition. We want machines that are actually beneficial to us, uh, not to themselves, so to speak. And so um, we want it to be the case that their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives, the objectives that are actually in us uh, and not uh, in them. And so this um, can be turned into uh, a way of thinking about the design of AI systems. Um, and I'll just focus on uh, the second principle here. Uh, it means that the, the machine or the, the robot is going to be uh, intrinsically uncertain about the human preferences that according to the first principle, it's supposed to satisfy. Uh, and, and this is a crucial change uh, in the way we think about AI. Um, and you can turn that into uh, a mathematical model called an assistance game. Uh, so it's a game between uh, a human and a machine. And the way the game is defined, uh, the human has the preferences or in game theoretic terms, the payoff function. The payoff function of the robot is the same as the humans but the robot doesn't know what it is. Um, and so this is a, I would say, completely different kind of AI that we need to do and you get completely different kinds of solutions. Uh, the AI system will, uh, in these games, defer to human instruction. Uh, it'll ask permission before taking actions that it's not com completely sure will be beneficial to people and in the extreme case, it will allow itself to be switched off rather than preventing itself from being switched off, which is uh, typically what would happen in the standard model. Um, and we can show that it's uh, under, under certain idealistic assumptions or idealized assumptions, it's rational for humans to build machines that solve assistance games. And um, so there's uh, still uh, a ton of work to do, but I think, um, uh, I'm reasonably confident that as we do all that work, as we elaborate and enrich this framework um, and make it closer to being realizable, um, we'll keep the, se the same property, which is that the better the AI, the better the outcome for human beings, the system will be better at figuring out what our preferences are, as well as better at actually realizing them. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, questions that people have asked over the years, and here are uh, some of them just to save everyone some time. Uh, aren't you building in one set of values and whose values are they? Uh, and the answer is no, we're not building in one set of values at all. Um, there are 8 billion people, the system should have 8 billion preference models. Uh, some of them will be more fleshed out than others because any given system will have more experience of, of some individuals and some uh, kinds of people, and that's uh, that's inevitable. Um, uh, some people ask, well, won't it learn from bad humans to behave badly? And uh, no, we're not doing imitation learning. Uh, we're not copying the behavior of the humans because we we understand that uh, that human decisions are shaped a lot by constraints and contexts, and um, what we would like to understand really is the motivation behind uh, decisions. And of course, the AI system uh, is also constrained to take into account the, the interests of all the humans. Uh, and so it can't take a bad action that will uh, impinge negatively on others. Um, isn't it the same as imitation learning? Nope. Uh, won't, won't people have to do millions or zillions of 
demonstrations of behavior in order for the system to learn uh, about what human preferences are. Uh, and I think the answer is no, um, partly because there's already a vast amount of evidence about what human preferences are. I mean, everything we've ever written uh, contains massive amounts of information uh, about human preferences because uh, partly it describes human actions and human reactions uh, to those actions, um, but also uh, it constitutes human action. So the act of writing is an act uh, and, uh, and that itself is evidence of, of what humans care about. Um, a technical point that some, some people raise is, well, if we're uncertain about the preferences, why don't we just uh, integrate out the uncertainty and, and then we can get uh, you know, actions that maximize expected utility with respect to that uncertain uh, preference model. Um, and that's, that's correct only under the circumstance where uh, future interactions cannot yield any further information about human preferences. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a folk theorem that you might see in some MDP textbooks uh, or, or papers about decision making that say that you know, uncertainty about the reward function isn't interesting because you can just integrate it out and replace with the, the expected reward. Uh, but that's simply not the case uh, for any situation where additional information can be obtained. And that comes from the fact that there's a person in the game. Uh, and um, some people argue that you know it's too hard to learn an explicit preference model. The preference model is too complicated. Um, and that might be true, but it's also not necessary to learn the explicit preference model. We can have uh, assistance game solvers that simply learn what is the optimal policy for the assistance game uh, without necessarily explicitly constructing the, the preference model as an intermediary. Uh, lots of open questions. Um, we have to figure out uh, you know, the, the basic preference aggregation problem that moral philosophers and economists have studied uh, for thousands of years uh, and the advanced versions of the preference aggregation problem such as future generations, uh, people who may or may not exist depending on the decisions you make, um, and various other uh, quandaries, I guess, um, comparisons of preferences across individuals, um, the so-called utility monster problem, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that today. Um, dealing with the fact that we'll have billions of uh, AI systems, uh, how do we make sure that they don't have uh, strategic interactions with each other that cause problems. Um, if you're going to learn from uh, from real human beings, we have to take into account the fact that human behavior is not a perfect reflection of our own preferences. So to um, to invert the behavior to get out the preferences, we need to the systems or us need to learn more about uh, our own cognitive architectures. Um, Probably the biggest problem from a philosophical point of view is the fact that we are plastic in the sense that our preferences are not fixed. Uh, obviously, we acquire them over our lifetimes uh, and they are still subject to, uh, uh, to modification. Um, so obviously, you don't want uh, AI systems to simply modify people's preferences uh, to make them easier to satisfy, which is in some sense what the social media algorithms are doing. Um, but you also have to ask questions about um, whether the preferences of individuals are, are, in a sense, truly autonomously acquired or whether they're inculcated by uh, a society uh, for the purposes of some, um, some elite uh, who wishes the populace to have certain desires uh, because that maintains the, uh, the social order that they benefit from. Um, foundations, we need to, uh, if we're going to get rid of this assumption that we know what the objective is, then all the basic technologies of AI, such as search and planning and reinforcement learning, uh, need to be rebuilt. Um, and in particular, they need to involve uh, some interactive relationship with human beings uh, through which preference information flows uh, at runtime. And that's the main characteristic of of the, the new model compared to the old model. 
Uh, and then perhaps if we can build uh, applications in areas such as the ones listed, we'll be able to uh, convince the rest of the field uh, that this is in fact the right way to think about AI because you just get better systems, uh, better behaved, more robust, more reliable, uh, and, and much less likely to do um, disastrous things. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, but I think of this as a, a sort of an outer framework. It's not telling us anything about the, uh, the design of the AI systems. It's really sort of a, a specification in a, in, a, in a general sense. These are guiding principles. They're not laws that the AI system itself is consulting in the way that Asimov uh, imagined. So um, I think it's going to be particularly difficult if we imagine that um, the kinds of uh, systems we'll build in the future that are tending towards being human level general purpose AI are really black box systems. So I'll just use this uh, acronym BBAI for black box AI um, to mean intelligent systems that are operating according to some internal processes and organization that we simply don't understand. And I think that's, uh, that's the case now for the large um, uh, the large language models for the uh, the deep networks that are doing computer vision. Uh, we simply don't know what they're doing and uh, we don't know how they work. We don't know how they generalize or if they generalize. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the doubts that are creeping in now about those, those kinds of uh, ways of building AI systems. So I would argue that we cannot uh, ensure that that those systems are going to be conforming to the principles uh, that we need them to conform to if they're going to be safe. Um, so I'm beginning to think that actually uh, part of what the AI safety community needs to do is actually to put effort into other ways of building AI systems rather than trying to sort of uh, you know, after the fact, build safety into these black box AI systems that we don't understand uh, to build systems that are kind of safe uh, in their, uh, the way that they are constructed. So safe by design, um, right down to uh, the individual components. So, um, so in a sense, it looks a little bit more like the, the approach that um, was common uh, before deep learning became popular. Uh, where we have semantically well-defined representations of knowledge or reasoning processes uh, and decision-making processes where each component of the system uh, can be checked individually because it has semantics, you can basically ask if it's true. Um, what's, what's different, I think, now that we might not have been able to do you know, in the 90s or early 2000s is that we can still construct all of this by a process of machine learning. So it doesn't mean uh, you know, abandoning the advantages of uh, building through machine learning, but it means that we're learning different kinds of things uh, than they are in deep learning. Um, we can build agent architectures from multiple uh, components, and we need a, a rigorous theory of how those components are composed together and, and the properties of the, the composite uh, agent architecture based on the properties of the individual components. Um, and then just generally, I think um, there needs to be much more emphasis on uh, rigorous formally verified um, software stack. Uh, and I, this is not just for AI, I think this is for the entire uh, digital infrastructure of the world. We are, we are woefully vulnerable uh, to all kinds of failures there. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a kind of fault tree analysis that one could do um, to, to try to figure out, you know, is it better from the point of view of long-term AI safety uh, to put an effort into well-founded AI systems? And there's one possibility which would say, you know, actually it's not, uh, which is that if black box AI is guaranteed to fail, in other words, if it could never produce uh, transformative or human level AI systems, um, then uh, why don't we just let it continue 
Uh, and from the point of view of AI safety, that would be ideal because then we'd never have anything to worry about. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a possible argument, and but it's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to just say, suppose that uh, we do need uh, well-founded AI in order to have systems that we are confident are safe and beneficial. So let me just briefly mention some reasons why I think that black box AI uh, may actually uh, not get us to human level AI. Um, and so even if that's true, right, what inevitably what would happen then is it hits a wall um, and people cast around for other ways of keeping progress in AI going. Um, and I think, I guess I'm arguing we may as well get going on that now. The, uh, the first reason is that um, if what you're doing is training circuits, there are many, many concepts such as the rules of Go, which are very hard to represent in a circuit um, because circuits don't have the ability to, to basically express universal quantification, uh, for example, over the squares, over the pieces, over the time at which the event takes place. And so, um, so that, that means that the process of learning those concepts uh, is extremely slow, slow, requiring millions, billions of examples instead of tens or hundreds. Um, uh, a second point is that um, one interpretation of, of adversarial examples, which are examples where small perturbations to inputs cause uh, deep learning systems to change their mind completely about the category, uh, for example, of an image, uh, one, one hypothesis about why that's happening is in fact that uh, the, the deep convolutional networks are not actually learning a generalizable uh, interpretive process for the image. Uh, and the dimple manifold conjecture from um, Adi Shamir uh, says that what seems to be happening is that in fact they're learning a giant lookup table that's um, constrained to operate in the manifold of uh, naturally occurring images. Um, so you get some generalization. Uh, for example, if you make a small, uh, if, if you make a small movement parallel to that manifold, you're going to get uh, a similar image that also looks natural. You're not going to sort of open up a big hole uh, in, in the object. Uh, it'll be more like a rotation of the object or a movement of the object or a change in the color of the object. Um, so, uh, so this conjecture seems to agree quantitatively with a lot of the phenomena of uh, adversarial examples, and it would suggest that uh, that deep learning systems, uh, at least in the area of vision, are, are simply not doing the right thing at all. Uh, and then there's other sort of more practical uh, anecdotal evidence. Where so, um, so a group at MIT looked at a number of uh, vision systems on ImageNet data, and so. Uh, on the left-hand column, for example, this is the, the top left is the original image of a parachute. Uh, and then the red pixels are the pixels that the classification algorithm is paying attention to in order to decide that this is a parachute. Uh, and so you can see that actually it's not looking at anything other than the sky. Uh, you know, if you look at the, in the third column, this catamaran, again, the red pixels are not on the catamaran. Uh, and so, um, and if you look at the, the golden retriever, right, it's looking at the grass to decide that this is a golden retriever. And presumably that's because of a regularity that exists in the training set and the test set um, that of course wouldn't hold in general in the, in the real world. Um, and so this, uh, this tendency to just find spurious regularities that have absolutely nothing to do with recognizing the category uh, is, is something, it's not the algorithm's fault, right? It's just uh, our uh, over-enthusiastic interpretation of the fact that the algorithm does well on, uh, on the training sets. Um, and you know, another set of uh, problems, uh, there's a, a paper from Google, and this is a summary of that, uh, of that paper from Google, showing that um, 30 of their uh, big deep learning uh, applications that were fielded turned out not to work uh, once they were fielded, even though uh, in all of the training and testing uh, that they did, uh, it looked like it was working great. Um, and similar problems have happened, for example, with the skin cancer apps, there were a great deal of hoo-ha about skin cancer detection, 
Um, those apps have all been withdrawn from the market because they just don't work. Uh, and Francois Chollet, who wrote the deep learning uh, textbook, uh, admits at the end of the book, like many more applications, just completely out of reach uh, for deep learning techniques. And he suggests that instead we need models which are closer to general purpose computer programs. Um, so that's what I want to talk about next. There are models that are closer to general purpose computer programs called probabilistic programs, uh, and they date back to the late 90s, um, some work that uh, Daphne Koller and Avi Pfeffer did uh, in my group, along with David McAllister from, uh, from Toyota Technical Institute. Um, and here's a very quick overview. I'll give you an example in a second. Um, they combine probability theory with some universally expressive formal language, which could be a programming language, or it could be uh, something like first order logic. Um, and the nice thing is that you get that expressive power. So if I want to write the rules of Go in one of these languages, it's one page instead of a million pages. Um, and uh, they're universal, so we can represent concisely any probability model that uh, can be represented in any formal language. Uh, and um, we can have general purpose uh, inference and learning algorithms. So for any model, any data, any query, in principle, subject to constraints on computation time, uh, we, we get that kind of generality. So it, it feels like it has the sort of wherewithal for general purpose intelligence, even though there is still a long way to go uh, in, in terms of making this practical. Um, and they give you this ability, which I think is really important to combine prior knowledge and data in a way that's cumulative. So um, we all know that if you're able to supply prior knowledge to a learning system, uh, you can get learning to happen from far fewer examples. Um, and then out the other end, you get some new knowledge. And what you would like is that new knowledge is, then can be fed back uh, into the whole process so that you get this cumulative development, just as we have in science, where uh, you know we can now do things like detect the collision of two black holes on the other side of the universe um, because of hundreds of years of cumulative acquisition of uh, concepts and physical laws of knowledge and technique um, to make that possible. So PPL, if you're not familiar with it, um, really uh, was very quiet for the first uh, 10 years or so, um, and then started to take off. Um, and now is up to, as of 2020, uh, at least according to Google Scholar, about 2,500 papers a year. There are uh, significant groups at Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, and uh, a bunch of universities around the world. Um, I'll just give you one example, which is monitoring for the nuclear test ban treaty. So that takes data from a network of sensors, mostly seismic, but also hydroacoustic and infrasound all over the world, uh, and about two terabytes of data per year coming in across the satellite network to Vienna. Um, and this is some of the, what a typical seismic signal looks like. Um, and then you're trying to uh, collect all that data and figure out what are all the seismic events uh, that have taken place in the world? Where are they? Uh, how big were they? How deep were they? And which ones might have been nuclear explosions? Uh, and that's called the daily bulletin um, that we produce. And so the evidence is all this, uh, all this data coming in. So it might, it's mostly seismic. Uh, the query is what happened, so what events took place in the world. Um, and the model that we can write in the probabilistic program uh, describes the elementary geophysics. Uh, so, so what any seismology student knows about geophysics, uh, we can write it down uh, in the form of a probabilistic program. And there it is. Uh, and this took, um, I wrote it during the lunch break uh, in, in a meeting I went to in Vienna. Uh, and it works about two or three times better than the uh, the then uh, uh, official United Nations uh, global seismic monitoring system, uh, which is sort of the result of 100 years of seismology research. Uh, so I'm not going to go through it in detail, but the point is that um, we can write very uh, large scale models. So this uh, this model in real time is doing probabilistic inference with hun hundreds of thousands of random variables. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it runs on uh, a laptop. 
So it doesn't require, uh, you know, TPUs. A TPU is about 10 million laptops. Um, and so um, the, uh, the computation requirements, often people say, well, well probabilistic programming doesn't work because it needs too much computation. Uh, this, this actually doesn't need that much computation uh, at all. Uh, and it works, as I said, way better. So this is uh, a 2013 uh, explosion in North Korea that we detected in real time and, and also got a much more accurate location compared to uh, the, uh, the assembled geophysicists uh, at the Test Ban Treaty Organization. Uh, another example, right, we can do things like real-time video tracking. Um, and this is the, uh, this is the sort of the standard uh, technique for most of the last 20 years uh, called adaptive uh, background mixture model, um, which represents each pixel as being drawn from a, a Gaussian mixture uh, of uh, either background, uh, foreground, or shadow. And, um, and then uh, with every new image, you basically update your mixture of Gaussian model uh, and you classify all the pixels and then that gives you separation between foreground and background and allows you to track moving objects. Um, so you can write that, this is basically that model written in a probabilistic program. Um, but we can actually, the nice thing is that, uh, so first of all, you don't have to do any math, right? So you, you write this model and the, the inference engine does all the math for you, right? So you don't have to do a whole PhD for each new kind of probabilistic model that you want to deal with. Uh, you just write, uh, you write the code and, it, and it, everything else is taken care of. So for example, if I want to change it to be uh, a much more sophisticated model where um, the category that each pixel belongs to, foreground, background, or shadow, rather than you know, being uh, drawn independently from the Gaussian mixture at every time step, actually has its own internal persistence. So once you're in shadow, you're going to stay in shadow for some uh, number of frames, and then you're going to flip to foreground and stay in foreground for some number of frames. So kind of a hidden Markov model for every single pixel. Well, that's all you do, right? You, you add one line to the model um, and, uh, and you're done, right? The inference and the learning all happens automatically. Uh, and then we get a uh, really good performance. So this shows that we get much better uh, tracking of objects with much less artifact than uh, the OpenCV uh, computer vision library. So uh, to make this um, practical for, you know, as a basis for provably beneficial AI, uh, we need to do a few things. One is um, we need to uh, go from probabilistic programs that are just representing probability models to probabilistic programs that are actually fully fledged agents um, operating in assistance games. Um, so state estimation, in fact, the, the example I just showed is a form of state, state estimation. So keeping track of the state of the world over time, that's the core of uh, an agent in my view. Um, and then on top of that, you can add various forms of decision-making. Um, and to do that, we need to extend PPLs with actions and rewards. Um, and this actually uh, creates some quite interesting and complicated uh, sort of quasi philosophical problems, somewhat similar to what happens when you extend logic to talk about uh, knowledge, you get modal logic uh, and you get various kinds of um, referential opacity issues. So here, for example, if I have an action, if I have a first order language, I can have an action like assassinate the leader of Spectre, right? But when you have uncertainty over the identity of objects, then that action is not uh, doesn't have a unique referent. So it's not just that you're not sure who it is, but you're not even sure what that action means, given that you don't know who the leader of Spectre is. Um, and so the uh, solving those kinds of problems, I think, is you know we have some ideas about how to do that, um, and uh, we can we can develop that uh, framework extending PPLs with actions and rewards. Um, and I think. Uh, the the aspect uh, that you need for assistance games is uncertainty over the reward functions. Um, and I think that's actually a fairly natural fit for uh, for probabilistic programming. 
Um, there's a formalism called uh, CP nets, Caterus Paribus nets, uh, that was developed in the 90s. It's a sort of a Bayes net like representation of preference structures, uh, or, uh, or you know, think of it as reward functions or utility functions. Um, and then, you know, lifting those to a first order language and then allowing for uncertainty over those preferences, I think is something that uh, we can uh, we can probably do okay in uh, probabilistic programs. Um, the second part we need is uh, a real theory of agent architectures, right? We, I, we can't imagine, at least I can't imagine that um, the kinds of systems we will want to build as we start to approach human level AI will be a single large black box, right? Just one thing uh, and that we train it to be superhuman at everything. I just don't see that. Um, it will have uh, multiple components connected in, um, in ways that uh, hopefully will combine to produce uh, safe, beneficial, intelligent behavior. Um, but at the moment, we don't have a good theory of, uh, of agent design. Uh, if, you, if you go and look at places where they actually build real agents, um, for example, the Mars rover is a real agent, self-driving cars are real agents and so on. Um, they have lots of boxes and lots of arrows joining those boxes together. Um, it's very common, for example, to talk about three layer architectures for, uh, for physical uh, intelligent systems where the lowest layer is the uh, sensory motor control. So the, you know, the servos that make sure your wheels turn at a constant speed and, and so on and so forth. Right, uh, all the way up to the high level. So um, why is that good? No one knows, right? It's just evolved over, over time uh, where people say, well, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm pretty sure my boxes and arrows are better than your boxes and arrows. Uh, that's not a very satisfactory foundation. Um, and there's a theory called bounded optimality, which I think may offer a way to have a better answer to that question. Um, so very briefly, uh, this is a quick reminder um, of that idea. Uh, so the first concept that we need is an agent function, which is a, you know, a standard concept in AI, right? The function that maps uh, from a sequence of inputs, like here we're playing Tetris. So this is the sequence of screens you observe uh, with objects appearing and new objects appearing. Um, so you go from a sequence of observations to uh, an action. And uh, that's what we mean by the agent function. Um, that agent function is running on a machine. Um, so we fix the machine uh, and then we choose some program uh, that uh, L drawn from the language that that machine can support. Uh, and then the running of that program on the machine produces an agent uh, which has agent function F. And um, you know, interestingly, not all agent functions are computationally feasible. Uh, many agent functions, for example, an agent function that solves the halting problem uh, doesn't exist on any computable uh, device. Um, but for any given machine, there's a set of functions that are feasible, uh, which is basically all the functions that can be produced by any program that runs on that machine. And then the concept of bounded optimality is basically uh, to, is to say that the, the best agent you can produce is the one that's running uh, the, the best of the feasible uh, uh, programs that can run on that machine. Um, and so that depending on the memory size and speed and so on of the machine, that, that may be an extremely stupid program, uh, or it may be extremely brilliant if, if this is a machine with lots of resources. Um, and then we can weaken that concept slightly uh, to get something called asymptotic, uh, asymptotically bounded optimal uh, programs um, by allowing a, a slight, uh, you know, as we do with big O notation, right, a, a constant factor uh, slowdown. Um, so here, what we say is that uh, L is asymptotically bounded optimal or ABO if the value of L the agent produced by L running on a machine that's K times faster uh, is at least as high as the value of the optimal program running on the original machine M. Um, and so this gives you a much more robust notion, so it's much less dependent on the details of the program and the details of the machine. 
Um, and it's this notion that allows us to get composition. Uh, so here's one very simple example, right? Suppose that you're operating in uh, environments where there's a deadline, right? You have to act by a certain time. Um, and uh, let's suppose that if I know the deadline in advance, I know how to construct an ABO program for that task. So let's say uh, I have exactly uh, 10 seconds to uh, decide on the answer to a question. Um, and let's imagine that I can write the a uh, ABO program for any fixed deadline. Um, and let's let LI be the ABO program for a fixed deadline at two to the I times epsilon. And we'll see why that matters in a second, right? Um, and now suppose that we don't know the deadline, right? Uh, can you make a real-time decision-making system for an unknown deadline out of these components? And the answer is if you uh, if you simply string together the programs for these uh, exponentially increasing uh, fixed deadlines and you string them together in this sequence, so you start with the shortest one and then the second shortest one and so on, uh, then you can show that that whole program uh, is asymptotically bounded optimal for any deadline distribution. So uh, effectively, it's as good as if you knew the deadline in advance. So that's a very simple example of how to make a composite agent architecture out of simpler agents uh, and still have uh, a, a rigorous theorem about the properties of the composite agent. So that's what we are aiming for. Um, um, to yeah, we running out of time? Yeah, we are out of time. We need to get to the next presentation as well. Already? Um, okay. Well, uh, will you be I, on GatherTown? I, I don't remember. Uh, yes, I will go. I'll go to GatherTown just uh, if you send me the link. Um, okay. Uh, wonderful. Okay. Um, so last bit uh, learn about formal methods because they are real and practical uh, and we don't use them nearly enough. Um, and that's. That's the summary. So basically arguing that uh, the AI safety community needs to think about uh, a well-founded approach to building AI systems. Uh, and these are some possibilities for how to do that. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Professor Russell. Um, and yeah, we will be on GatherTown. Um, so uh, yeah, can we get uh, someone from production maybe to drop the link in the chat? Um, so yeah, if you if you join us on Gather Town, we'll have Q and A. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Bye.